Today, I'm speaking with John Boziak. John has been called one of the most prolific manufacturers of counterfeit credit cards in history. He was a homeless kid on the streets of Miami and eventually became one of the most cunning scammers, counterfeiters, and identity thieves of all time. I want to apologize off the rip. John was traveling today to LA for an upcoming film, so our sound quality was not up to my standards. I really hope it doesn't bother you, and I promise it won't happen again. What struck me most about John's story is how complex and how many moving parts his scam required just to stay afloat. This conversation was like a movie. I really hope you enjoy the ride. Before we begin, to thank you for checking out the new show, I'm giving away a PlayStation 5 to one of my viewers. All you have to do is like this video and subscribe to enter. That's it. Full details in the comments. Now please welcome John Boziak to the Welcome Home Podcast. So what I was doing, I was paying, I think I was paying like damn near $100 per card. And it came, it was a, you know, obviously it was a fraudulent credit card. It came uh, with a dump already loaded onto it. And you honestly, you never know how much somebody has in their bank account. You know, there's no way of checking that. There's no way of finding out the balance or whatever. I mean, you, you can kind of give an idea because the first five digits of any credit card um, dictate what bank it's issued by and whether it's a, 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 a platinum, a gold, uh, a regular debit. You know, so you can kind of get an idea. But then, as, like I said, at the end of the day, you don't know how, many, what, how much money somebody has in their bank account. So when you go to use these cards, it's like it's, it's anybody's guess. You know what I mean? And then, like, back then, there was, like, no security. It was wide open back then. So, say I'm from Florida, and my card's being used in California. Well, back in the day, that didn't raise any flags with the bank. Nowadays, if I'm from Florida and my card's being used in California, they automatically shut it off, turn it off. And then you got to call your bank and you got to get your, you know what I mean? Or you got to call your bank and let them know you're going to be traveling to whatever city. You know, so back in the day, you could just... I can just get a bunch of cards and I can go out and use them, you know, without having to worry about the, the zip codes and all that being flat. So how many L's are you taking early on? Like how many times are you going to Best Buy or Walmart and they're chasing you out? I assume you're taking a great yeah. deal L's. Almost enough to make you want to quit. Wow. Yeah, almost enough to just completely discourage you from even wanting to do it in the first place. I mean, I had so much fucking bad luck just starting out. I mean, my cards were getting declined. Um, the plastic I was getting that I was ordering wasn't even that good. Like the, like the, 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 the it would be a skew. Like the, you know what I mean? The graphics would be a skew on it. And I got robbed for thousands and thousands of dollars by people online saying they were going to sell me something and I send them money and then I just they just disappear and I never get anything. You know what I mean? I probably got robbed for six thousand dollars, six or seven thousand dollars before I actually found somebody. That was willing to, that that sold me a, a halfway decent product. So you yeah, I took a lot of L's. you kept taking these L's, spending money, getting ripped off, but you kept going. Did you always think it was going to become this huge business you turned it into and become a prolific credit card scammer? Or like, what's keeping you? No, going? no, 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 nothing like that. I never had any, I never had any inkling that any of that was going to happen, and all of that kind of happened just by chance. It was just by chance. It was just by me getting one customer and because my business model was just so fucking great, you know, my customer service was impeccable. You know, if you messaged me, I got with you right back. If there were any problems with your order, I would send you out and I would fix it. Or if you got caught at customs, I would remedy it. Like I, my, my customer service was above all, you know. So I, it was just me getting hooked up with one guy who apparently was a buffer for like some Russian, the Russian mob. And that's that. That's when all. That's when everything just started happening. Eventually, you say I'm getting ripped off buying these cards. Half of them aren't working. They all look fucked. I'm gonna start manufacturing. Yeah, I I seen the potential. Like I knew there was money in it. I just had to keep working at it. I had to just keep trying and keep trying until I found something that works. Because you know, I, I understand the game. I understand where the, where the money is to be made, and I understand how to make the product. I just have to keep trying. It's just perseverance at the end of the day. So at a low level, 
buying a card, going to Best Buy, buying a card, going to Target. That was low level. You said, I don't even care about using these cards. I'm manufacturing. Or were you still obviously using your own cards? Well, that, that, that model wasn't sustainable. For any for any stretch by any stretch of the imagination, it just wasn't going to be sustainable in any kind of longevity. Because you you got to look at it like this: say I get say I hit every Walmart within a twenty mile radius of me in one day, and I do the Best Buy and all that shit, and I get a hundred laptops. Great, you're balling, right? You just got a hundred fucking laptops. You're fucking balling out of control. But guess what? Now you got to do it again, and you got to do it again, and you got to do it again, and you got to do it again. You got to keep fucking doing it, and you got to keep putting your face on cameras. You got to keep pulling up, and you, or you got to start involving other people, which is an absolute nightmare. You know what I mean? I had no co-defendants. Everything I did, I've always done by myself. You know, I didn't involve anybody in any of my schemes or my crimes. I committed all of them by myself. You know, for a reason. And so I see that there was just like, there's no way that I can keep doing this. You know what I mean? And make the money that I want to make. And that's when I was like, okay, I thought about something that somebody had told me one time about. About the, about the gold rush and, and back in, you know, the 18, 17, 1800s, 18th century or whatever it was, the man, they said, he told me that the dude, the guy making all the money, it wasn't the people mining the gold, it was the people selling the pickaxes. And, that, and then I just wrote my business model on that. And I was like, okay, enough grunt groundwork. You know, it's cool being able to go into any store and buy whatever you want, whenever you want. It's cool being able to go and just fill up my car with gas and never have to worry about gas prices or food or, you know, it's, it's cool, but that wears off after a while and reality sets in and it's like, okay, I have bills to pay. You know I mean? I have goals I'm trying to reach and this isn't going to do it. This is only going to get me sent to jail pretty much, you know? So I had to figure out a different problem. And as you were saying, you go to Best Buy and get a hundred laptops. That leads to a whole new problem of, well, I'm not going to use 100 laptops. Now I got to go on classified ads and try to sell these laptops. There's a whole part two of selling at half the cost. Um, yeah. Sounds like a headache. And then you're getting lowballed, and you got to deal with weird people coming to your house. And it's just it's a whole thing. Dude. It's a whole thing. How long does it take? And it's cool for a little while. How long does it take for you to manufacture your perfect card? And what does it feel like? Because I'm sure you fucked up a lot trying to make your own. Oh, piles, piles, and piles of just you know cards that didn't come out right. You know. Visa logos off, getting everything lined up. It probably took me a solid, probably a solid month and a half, two months of just fucking with it every single day until I had a, a, a verifiable product that looked like it was issued from a financial institution. So at that point, my actual credit card and the fake one, the average person probably won't be able to tell if any difference? No, no. And, 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 Neither would the um, professionals either. Wow. Because I was, using, I was using the same equipment that they were using to print the cards with. I mean, I had the UV, the, the ultraviolet, you know, um, security features on it. I mean, I had the, the holograms were all heat pressed. I mean, everything, the, the card stock was exactly what they used. The magnetic strip was exactly what they used. And you start selling these on one of the forums. How much do you sell them for? What's your profit margins? What's the business model early on? Right. So early on, um, I just wanted to kind of test the waters. And so I was just selling piece by piece. I was selling them for like a $50 uh, just for one blank card. And the order started coming in slowly but surely. I was selling more cards. I was selling more cards. And then, I, but I was looking at these other dudes selling cards and they had like packages. They had like, oh, you can sign up for the silver package and you pay $500 and you get X amount of cards. And then those send like driver's licenses or whatever with it. So I started looking at everybody else's business model and I was like, well, let me go ahead and order cards from everybody on the forums. So I ordered from every single vendor I could find that would send me a card. And then I wrote, okay, how long does it take for the card to get here? And I monitored each one. How long does it take for me to get my card from this person? And then once I got the product, I looked at each one and I was like, okay, how can I make my, my product better? What can I do that's better than everybody else that's doing it? You know what I mean? So that I can just step on everybody and take and take 90% of the market where I, what I was trying to break into. So, How fast did it take when you became the leader on this forum? I'm assuming they have a review system. How fast do you go from, yeah. hey, I'm the new guy to I'm the biggest seller on this website? Uh, about six months. Oh, wow. About, 
about six months of just continually pushing out orders, getting good reviews. Um, I sent out um, cards to the actual administrator of the of the of the forums that that I was on, so that I could get like the the, the ultimate verified by the fucking forum. And then once I had the verification from the forum, and I was I was paying for advertise advertisements on the forum, so like banner ads and shit at the top of the forum was like, you know, U.S. Plastico, and then it would have my my ICQ uh, chat or whatever on it. And then so yeah, I mean, once I did all that, the order the order started coming in pretty fast. And I remember I remember waking up one morning, and I checked my emails, and I had 20 orders waiting up. Now, at this time, my new business model was $1,000 minimum order, and for $1,000, I would, I, was, I would give you 100 debit cards and 10 uh, driver's licenses of, of IDs or whatever you wanted, and I would work with the customer uh, on that. And so I woke up one morning, and I remember I had 20 orders waiting on it. That was like $20,000. Like $20, so when you say the IDs, if someone's purchasing something at Best Buy, you give them a matching ID? In case the cashier requests it, is that why the IDs come into it? Well, when you use, um, so when I sell these, these debit cards, you can never use it as debit, obviously, because you don't have the PIN number. So even though these are debit cards, you still have to process it as credit. Now, a lot of these big box stores, um, you, they, they're, you're required to show ID when anytime you process anything as credit, they have to, they have to, you have to show ID. And not only do you have to show ID, you have to physically hand them your card. And they have to take the last four digits that are on the card and they have to punch it into the POS machine as an added security feature to then process the sale. So if the ID doesn't, doesn't, doesn't match the card and the four digits that are on the card don't match what's encoded to the card, well, you're getting ran out of the store. Wow. So when, when you start really seeing that money come in, is that just coming because of the trust on the website, or are you starting to get some like big international buyers? No, at first it was just trust on the website. You know what I mean? It was just orders rolling in, just random, random people, random orders rolling in. Yeah. How many cards can you make per day? Because you mentioned that's, that's a lot, 20 orders. How many cards are you able to pump out? Yeah, I can print about 150 cards an hour. Holy sh... Given my printer doesn't overheat, which it did plenty of times, and then, you know, they would start melting and just shitting out cards, not right. Um, and I had to stop and change the print head on the, the printers, which are, those are like $950 just for the, you know, the print head. Um, and then you got to wait for it to come in the mail. So sometimes you would have those problems. But yeah, if everything was running smoothly, I could do about 150 cards an hour. So this is, is this pre-Bitcoin? Is that how you're getting paid? How are you getting the money to your account? Right, so I, I, this is back in the day. So this is this is pre Bitcoin. Um, we were using something called uh, Liberty Reserve. Uh, it was called LR LRZ, and then there was something else called uh, Web Monies, which was WMZ. Now this wasn't blockchain technology. This was just like some kind of like almost like a PayPal kind of deal, but it was international. Now the Fed, um, if you can give it a goo, uh, they they shut down Web Money, and I, I also believe they shut down uh, Liberty Reserve. Uh, as well. But I was also doing something where I had um, Western Union used to have, I don't know if they do, but they, they did, they were, they you could have these cards, like it was, a, it was a Western Union, it was a prepaid debit card issued by Western Union, but they would issue you a Western Union account. Now you had to go through verification, you had to send in your, your driver's license, copy of your driver's license, fill out, you know, your social security number, they had to verify your identity, but that wasn't an issue for me because I had access to however many different people's information I wanted, you know, so I could be anybody. And so I would have five or six of these cards that you could go to a Western Union location and load, send me a Western Union, it would just go straight to the card instead of me having to go to a physical location to pick up the cash. So as you're starting to grow and make serious money and have serious global clients, just on a personal level, how anxious are you? Are you paranoid? Are you, do you understand the gravity of, do you think people are following you? Like, where, where's the paranoia and anxiety because you're now in the big leagues. You're not just getting laptops yeah. anymore. You're shipping to Russia and, and various countries. So what, what, what's your yeah, state of well, mind? To be honest with you, um, I had less anxiety and less stress about doing what I was doing whether than going into the stores and always having like, you know what I mean? Like it was just, honestly, it was way less stress because I was sitting behind um, 
I was using somebody else's Wi-Fi signal where I had a Wi-Fi antenna, and I hacked somebody's Wi-Fi signal, and then I was using, um, I had Fox Proxy, and I had a VPN on top of that, so it was like anytime, and, and I was using a laptop, and I was never at home whenever I got online. So my internet security was, was, was tight. I didn't have to worry about that. So it's just like the only thing I had to really worry about was going actually to the UPS stores to send out the debit cards or whatnot. But even that really wasn't a big deal because in southern Florida, there's a thousand of them. You know, so you can hit a different one every time and you know it would take you three months to cycle through and by the time you got back to the first one they wouldn't even know who you are anymore. so was your success based on what era you came up in or am i wrong to think in 2021 with all the tech and security advances that credit card fraud is nearly impossible oh well it's never impossible it's just the game's changed now you know what i mean the game's changed a little bit um security protocols are different you know, but there's always a workaround, you know, there's always a way in, there's always a way to do it. I mean, it's just, you know, like in the beginning when, when credit cards were, you know, first around and all the way up until now, it's just, it's just an evo a never ending evolution of fraud. And people are always going to find ways to, to try and, you know what I mean? Scam the system. It's just, it is what it is. But I do believe a lot of my success came from, you know, just the era that I was doing it in because it was relatively new. I mean, of course it was widespread. And there was a lot of people doing it, but it's not like now. It's nothing like it is now where, you know, school kids are trying to, you know, claiming to be scammers, you know what I mean? And it, the whole thing is just completely ridiculous now. You know, so yeah, when I was doing it, like I said, it was the heyday. It was like robbing banks in the 20s. You know what I mean? Like anybody could do it. You could, you could rob 100 banks in one day in, in 1925, you know? So. so how long are you riding high? You're at your peak. You're crushing it. And then when does it start to go wrong? Because I know you had a run where you were killing it, but things obviously yeah. went south. So explain the, the high and the beginning of the low. Right. So I had about a good two years, a two-year run, you know, probably from about 2000 and well, a little bit over two years, probably from about 2000, late, early 2006 to about 2000, July of 2009, when I was um, subsequently... Uh, set up by the Secret Service. So yeah, about a two year run and it started slow. You know, I mean, it, was, it was definitely like a bell curve, if you will. Um, you know, and like when I hit my, when I hit my, my absolute pinnacle of, of what I deemed to be my success, I was doing probably a hundred orders a month. Wow. So about a hundred thousand dollars a month in orders I was doing, you know, on average. Now that wasn't every month, but that was, that was about what I averaged, I think, I feel. At, at the very pinnacle. How does this uh, go south? Like you mentioned getting set up by the Secret Service. Do you, how does this all go left? Uh, I ended up moving to South Carolina um, from South Florida. And in South Carolina, I wasn't in a big city. So I wasn't in like Raleigh, Durham, or you know what I mean, Columbia, or anything like that. I was in a very small town, and there was only two UPS stores. You know, and then the other, the only other UPS store was like an hour away and that was it. There was like three, you know, and all my, all my packages had to go international. So I just couldn't take them to the post office. You know, I couldn't drop them in a, in a, in a drop bin, you know, so I had to go into the UPS store and that was uh, ultimately the, the, the nail, nail in the coffin for me. Um, the, the older gentleman at the UPS store uh, apparently just got suspicious of me, you know, Maybe he thought I was selling out, sending out drugs or, or whatever. You know, I was young. I had a nice car. I'm in there every other day sending packages out. And they're going everywhere. They're going to Russia. They're going to Mexico. You know, they're going everywhere. So um, he just got suspicious one day and opened one of my boxes that I was sending out and found what I was sending out. And uh, he contacted the Postmaster General, the Postmaster General, um, and in turn contacted the United States Secret Service. And then it was just like a sting operation. Pretty much after that. When you're in a big city, you're going to a million and one UPS. You have a million options. They'll see you one time every six months, one time a year. So this all ends yep. because you moved to a small town. Why did you move to that small town? And weren't you afraid of the heat that was going to come? Yeah, I was cocky at this point because I had been doing it for so long. Um, and I was, I just got, I was too comfortable. 
and I let my guard down. And I was the, my my girlfriend that I was with at the time. We had just had we had a, a baby, my son Nicholas. Uh, she was from South Carolina, so she kind of wanted to go back and be with be by her family, and you know, because they hadn't you know seen the baby and all that yet. And you know, in my mind, I'm like, listen, I I have the means to travel where I want, when I want, you know what I mean, and move freely about the country. So to me, it didn't really matter where I lived because I was like, I can do this anywhere, you know. And it was just it was it was just getting too comfortable is what ended up. Um, screwing me. I'm Canadian, um, so I'm not sure the U.S. laws, but isn't it illegal to open a sealed package? It is. It is. Yeah, and um, they had to. They had to throw out a lot. They had. They had to get rid of so many charges because of that. Oh wow! So yeah, they call the Secret Service, and they they set you up to bring you back. What exactly happened? And Walk me through the all the emotions sure. in the scenario of the arrest. Um, so I, I wake up one morning and I got an email from the UPS store uh, telling me that I had a package waiting on me, um, which isn't out of the ordinary because when you if you do get a package, they, they do. It's like an automated email you get. And I got the automated email. Um, just so happens the day that I, the package shows up that I get the automated email is the same day that the Secret Service is down there waiting on me. Because they didn't know who I was, you know, because I had made a fake driver's license with somebody else's um, oh. information on it, just with my picture when I opened the UPS. Because I didn't, you know, so they didn't know who I was or where I lived. They didn't have my license plate number. And even if they did, it was registered to an address in Michigan. You know what I mean? So it was like, um, but my bad luck uh, just so happens the day that I, I have to go there to pick up a package, which I did have a package waiting on me. The Secret Service was there waiting on me. And I show up. Um, I signed for my package. I, I didn't, there was no red flag, nothing fell off, which is weird because I usually, I usually, when, when something's about to happen and I don't know why, I always get this feeling in my stomach, you know, and I've avoided, and I've, a lot of, a lot of things in my life, I've avoided a lot of times where I almost got picked up by the Secret Service or the U.S. Marshals, you know, I would leave and they would just, so there was a lot of things, but this time I just, there was nothing that, you know, made me sick to my stomach. So I just went and I signed for my package, I'm getting ready to leave. Um, to walk out the door, and here come two Secret Service agents coming through the door in plain clothes. And I, and, and I almost tried to walk past them, but then I seen the badges on their belts. And that's when, you know, you get that lump in your throat, and, you're, and, you're, my, and my, heart, my, my heart rate just accelerated, and I knew I was fucked. Like, I knew it was over at that, at that point. And they were like... Um, uh, Mr. Pearson, Ryan Pearson, and I was like, because that was the name I was using, I was like, yeah, and they were like, oh, well, we need to talk to you about what you've been sending out of here, and I tried to play dumb for a couple minutes, I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, you know what I mean, and they're like, well, we're just coming back, you know, come in, come in the back and just have a, discuss, have a chat with us, so um, we go in the back of the UPS store, and um, I sat down, and they're like, we know, they're like, we know what you've been sending out of here, we have, we got your package, and I'm like, all right. And in my mind, I'm like, okay, how much do they know? You know what I mean? Now I'm trying to gauge how much do they know so I'm not, so I can just give them a, enough, you know, because I'm not going to tell on myself. I'm not going to be like, oh, you got me. I guess I might as well just tell you everything. You know what I mean? Because that's not how I, how I grew up. Um, so I kind of just was like, all right. I was like, yeah, I've been sending, you know, I, obviously you know what I've been sending. I'm, you know, making credit cards. I'm selling on the internet. And he says, uh, they asked, well, how long have you been doing it? And I said, I don't know, like three months or something like that. I told him I, I had just started. I had just started, you know, printing cards and selling them. And, um, you know, so he gets on the phone with his boss, and then they talk to somebody down at the, 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 his headquarters, and then they call back, and then, you know, they, say, they start questioning me a little bit further, and they're like, okay, well, where's your, where's the, where are you doing all this time? Where's the lab? And I tell him, I said, I got a condo, you know, just on the other side of town, and I have a spare bedroom, and I just, I print everything out of there. So then he calls down he, to his boss and he talks to him some more and then they fax some paperwork down and he's like, well, listen, I need you to fill out, I need you to sign this paperwork because we need to come, we need to go to your house and we need to search and we're going to see everything. And at this point, I'm like, I'm almost thinking like to go tell them to go fuck themselves and let's go to jail. You know what I mean? And just take my chances because they, they don't know where I live. And as long as I keep my mouth shut and just go to jail, they'll never know where I live. You know, they'll never, they'll never find out. You know what I mean? So then I was just, so I'm like, I'm, I'm weighing that option in my head. 
And then I'm like, you know what? I, I'm I'm a fucking con man. You know what I mean? I've been fucking with people and I've been conning people my whole life. That's just that's just how I've gotten by. So I'm like, I'm gonna fuck with them a little bit. So I start the discussion and um, I'm like, well, first of all, am I going to jail? That's my first question. Am I, am I being arrested right now? Before we go any further, am I under arrest? And they're like, as of right now, no, you're not under arrest. He's like, we could take you to jail. Right now, by all means, we could take you to jail. I'm like, well, obviously, you know, because they have the credit cards. So yeah, they could take me to jail. But he's like, we're not going to take you to jail. He's like, if you play ball with us, just work with us. He's like, well, you know, you're going to have to go to court. He's like, obviously, you're going to have a court date. And if you don't show up for court, you're going to have a warrant out for so he calls his superior again. They they he like, okay. They put him on speakerphone and they're like okay, you know, because I'm not giving any, giving up any information at the time. I'm I put up a wall. I'm done. I'm done talking. You know, until I kind of feel more comfortable that I'm not going to jail. So he gets his boss on the phone. We have like a little meeting in the back of the fucking UPS store. Um, they agreed not to arrest me, not to take me to jail as long as I agreed to give them all the equipment, let them search my home. Uh, I had to give up all my passwords. I had to give up all to all the forums. I had to give everything, everything, all my all, every all my contacts, everything. So then I'm thinking in my head, I'm like, okay, what's on my laptop that can fuck me? You know what I mean? What's what's at my house that can that can put me away for 20 years? And luckily, I'm I'm really good about not keeping evidence around, just because I'm always been super fucking paranoid about keeping things at my house. You know, so a lot of my hard drives and a lot of, like, the things that was compiled, like, um, what do you want to say? What do you want to call it? My, um, um, damn, I, I have a loss for words. Um, my customers. So, like, my customer base, like, all my customer files, like, I would keep in a se on a separate um, removable hard drive. And I would keep track of everybody I've sold to and then how many, how many orders they've placed, what the orders number. That was just, it was just a quality control issue. You know what I mean? That way, if anybody ever had any issues, I can look back and I can go all the way back. I can see all the orders. I can see everything they've ever ordered from me and all that shit. So I had all of that. But I kept all of that on an external hard drive in a storage unit, you know what I mean, that I, that I wasn't going to tell them about because there's, there's just no way I'm giving that storage unit up. I had like $50,000 in cash. I had a car. I had my laptops. I had, you know I mean? I had a bunch of shit just put away. So I never kept anything at my house. So in my mind, I'm like, okay, all I have at my house are ba the basic shit I need to print cards with. And then I've got my laptops, you know, where I've been on the forums. And so they'll have my ICQ, my chat history, and all that shit. So I'm like, okay, fine, fuck it. I sign all the paperwork. And, um, you know, they come to my house. They put me in their car. They drive me to my condo. And then they just tore everything apart. You know, anything with removable storage on it, they confiscate. So they took my laptops, my hard drives. Um, at this time, there were no camera. I mean, there were barely camera phones. So we, had, we had digital cameras. So they took all, everything, anything with removable storage. They took, um, they confiscated all my equipment. They took my safe. They got about twenty thousand in cash. Um, I had like a thousand cards already printed up. I would just keep in my safe. That way, I would I would print ahead of time. That way, if somebody put an order, I could just bomb and send them out. So I wouldn't have to sit out, sit all day printing. Uh, yeah, and they pretty much just were like, you know, we're gonna give you a date, and they gave me a card, and they're like, you need to be at this address on this date which was like three weeks into the future. So they're saying, come to the head office, the secret service exactly. office with the suits. Yep. And I'm sure there was a, a bunch of people that wanted to hear from you. So walk me through going into this daunting, terrifying office. I'm sure it's a boardroom. What was that meeting like? Yep. What were they trying to get yep. out of you? Uh, it, was, it was pretty intense, man. I, and, and I found out at a later date, they flew people in from all over the country. So they flew people in from D.C., from Las Vegas, from Los Angeles, all the big heads from around the country that handles whatever district of fraud. They flew them in for this fucking meeting. So it was pretty intense. I walk into this room, and there's this long board table in the middle, and there's all these and – and, and listen, there's no fresh faces in that room. It's all old motherfuckers. You know what I mean? It's, it's old, distinguished white dudes in there. There's no, like, young agents. It's all older heads. So I knew I was fucking in trouble. And I knew that I had to limit my bullshit because you can, you can, the, the younger guys, you can kind of bullshit, but not the older guys because they've just been doing it too long. You know what I mean? So you kind of, you got to be careful what you say. You, have, you not only to be careful what you say, but you got to be careful how you say certain things. You know what I mean? So, and I got three weeks to fucking rehearse all this in my head. So I had it down 
cold. I had my story down cold. I wasn't going to break from my story no matter what kind of evidence they put in front of me. I was sticking to my fucking gun. So I go in there, and they got all these screenshots laid out in, in the middle of the table, this whole table. And it's screenshots of every forum that I had been on, of all my posts on the forums. They actually had ordered cards from me. The Secret Service had ordered cards from me previously, like months and months before, and I didn't know it. So they had, they had placed several orders from me. They just didn't know who I was and where I was. Like, they were trying to find me. And um, they, they just sat me down there. Like, they were putting pictures of people in front of me. Like, do you know this person? Do you know this person? Do you know this screen name? How, you know what I mean? Like, and then I was like, yeah, I know that. Well, how, what, are the, what are the interactions you've had with this person on this screen name? And do you speak Russian? Do you code? Uh, all, you know, just it was a three and a half hour, you know, marathon of just, you know, do you know this or... Or we have you done this? And and there were periods of time where you know everybody would just sit there quiet for two or three minutes, and they'd all just be looking at each other. And I would just be saying anything, and nobody would be saying anything. And then somebody would just speak up, and it would just start like a whole another thing. And it was just it was pretty wild, man. Yeah, it was pretty wild. So in their heads, is it accurate to say they thought they just caught the biggest credit card manufacturer in U.S. history? Are that do they think they got the guy? For flying oh yeah, them. they they yeah. Well, from what they told me, I was um I was the biggest guy doing what I was doing at that point in time in the in the entire country that they were aware of. And they're like, listen, we, our radar, we know every, who's doing what. And he's like, he's, nobody was doing what you were doing. And so I, apparently they thought that it was some giant operation. So all these old people, they're just they're fucking stunned that it's just me. And they keep, they just don't believe me. They're like, come on, give us the rest, give us, give us everybody. And I just, I'm, and the way I explain it and how I explained it to them, after a while, they're like, it just, it makes sense. They're like, we don't believe it. It's, it's astounding that you were able to accomplish what you were able to accomplish on your own and not involving anybody else, you know? So at the end of the day, they just were like, they, they, they still, I think they were still kind of skeptical, but like I said, I stuck to my guns and I stuck to my story, so. At what point do they charge you, and what are you facing uh, next? Um, yeah, so I start, uh, I get charged with, um, what did I get charged with? My charges, my charges were um, fraud, well, they were um, manufacturing a fraudulent transaction device, um, possession of a fraudulent transaction device, uh, possession of, um, Counterfeiting equipment, uh, wire fraud, mail fraud, and aggravated identity theft. Holy and I was looking at about 150 months uh, in the beginning. Yeah, it was the initial offer that they came with. And because that dude had opened, because the old man had opened my package at the at the UPS store, they had to get rid of almost all of it. Wow. Because whatever evidence that they gained, whatever charges they gained from opening up my package from from the actual physical uh, of the cards, was admissible now. You know, so now they could only stick me with the um, aggravated identity theft, and that was it. And that only carried that only carried a, a, a mandatory minimum sentence of twenty four months. And because of I, I never really, I didn't really have any criminal history. I mean, my youth, I had a very eventful youth. I mean, my youth was, you know, but as an adult, I don't really think I didn't really have any big felony charges. I'd never been, in, you know, arrested for drugs. Or, or, you know what I mean, nothing violent. So I didn't really have anything on my record that would push the judge to, to sentence me to more time. Yeah, so I got extremely lucky. I only served uh, like 30 months, I think, altogether. So after the first sentence, you end up getting back involved in this at some point. Is that correct? Do I have the sequence right? What, after all of this, after you're like, fuck, I'm caught, Secret Service is bringing me in, they think I'm the biggest manufacturer, what brings yeah. you to get back into the game? Yeah, um, three years went by, and I no court dates, no nothing. You know, so I'm, I mean, I, I knew it was coming, but it was like, so I know I'm going to prison, and like after after the first year of just laying low and not doing anything, and then kind of having to limit live a normal life, and it's just like. The only way I know how to make money is through fraud at that point in time. Like, you know, so it was like, that's the only way I really knew how to support myself. So I just geared up for another run and I just went back at it. Wow. So what was that next run like? Did you get back to that height that you were once at 
or did it uh, did it not quite reach there? The initial run, I think, between 2004 and 2009, I think I, I made approximately four and a half million dollars, give or take. Um, and then my second run, my second time, I, I only made approximately, because I only had about a year and a half run, but I got plugged in with the same people I was dealing with before. Um, and I, I think I netted maybe, I want to say a million and a half or somewhere around there, like 1.5, 1.7. I think it was, it was the second run. Yeah. How do you get caught for the final time? What is the, the final sequence of events? Well, I didn't, I actually didn't end up getting caught the second time. No, I, I didn't actually end up getting caught the second time. Uh, see, I got pulled over. Uh, I was with my wife and I get pulled over in Temple Terrace, Florida. And two cops, I, I get, you know, one cop comes, they take my driver's license and then um, three more cop cars show up. And I'm like, oh man, this is, now in my mind, I'm like, this is everything coming back to fuck me. You know what I mean? So I get picked up and then I get, I get transported to the jail. Um, while my wife, I'm, I'm actually married at this time. While I'm in the car with my wife, I tell her, I said, listen, I'm going to jail because there's multiple cop cars showing up right now. I'm going to jail. I said, go back home, get everything out of the house. Everything. All my printers, all my equipment that I had purchased again, get it out of the fucking house because they're, they're, they're going to come and search. Because at this time, there was something called Operation Open Market uh, taking place, which was, I think, a joint venture between the, uh, the United States um, Federal Bureau of Investigation and the United States Secret Service. And they were um, systematically taking down every um, forum at this time. So Dark Market, um, Carter.su, or Carter.ru, they were going through and they were systematically taking down all of the head people from all of these sites. They were taking everybody down. And so in my mind, I'm like, I didn't know if it was the shit coming back to fuck me or I, or I thought it was the operation over market. Either way, I knew I had to get all that shit out of my house. You know, so I go to jail. I got picked up. I go to jail. I sit there for like a day or two before I even figure out what's going on. I finally get in front of a judge and he was like, um, this is just a hearing. You have a, a, a federal a warrant out of the Southern District of uh, 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 South Carolina. And that's when it hit me. I'm like, okay, this is this is for that, not this, you know. So then I get back home. Uh, I get I get released like a couple days later on uh, pretrial services. I was on like federal pretrial services. I had to go go back to court and they had court dates scheduled in South Carolina. So then you know I got a call every single day. And if my they say you do not have to report today or you, it's like it's random. So I would have to go down randomly and you know take a your analysis and all that crazy shit. So I get out and I get home. And my wife had done, like I said, she had gotten rid of all the equipment. And I'm going through my drawers. I'm trying to find all my debit cards because my debit cards have all my money. I, I didn't have really any. I had maybe ten or 15000 in cash. But I didn't. all my money were on my debit cards because that's just the system that I like to use. Um, and I get back home and everything was gone. My equipment, the debit cards, anything that was linked to fraud, my wife had, had gone through and gotten rid of. Yeah. And it was in a landfill somewhere. How much money were on these debit cards? And what does it feel like to realize your entire savings are in a garbage? Uh, it was about 1.5. Oh, my goodness. Give or take. Oh, my goodness. And at this time, I, I'm still sick. To, I'm still sick right now talking about it. Yeah. You know? And it was just, it was just that feeling of hopelessness. All is lost. You know what I mean? All is lost. And... Now what do I do? Pretty much. That was the, the prevailing thought. It's like, I'm, I now, so now I'm going to prison, I'm broke, and all my equipment's gone. And I'm fucked, pretty much. You know? So I ended, up, uh, I ended up absconding on the pretrial release. You know what I mean? So I'm like, I'm just in a bad fucking spot. And uh, I end up failing like a drug test or something like that because I was smoking, smoking weed. And um, so I ended up absconding on a pretrial release, and I ran for a few months. It wasn't long before they, before they ended up finding me. And then the U.S. Marshals ended up finding me. We moved to a different apartment, and they came and arrested me and yeah, sent me to uh, I went to federal prison. Yeah. At the start of this conversation, we talked about how you were a young man that was homeless and 
what yeah. what's very interesting to me is the difference in lifestyles that you've you've gone through. You've had extreme highs and extreme lows. So we know your lowest was prison and homelessness, but when you were at your peak living in, you know, I'm sure you're going to Miami all the time. What was the peak lifestyle when you were just crushing it? Yeah. I mean, listen, I had a, I had a condo on Brickell Avenue uh, in downtown Miami, which they're not cheap. Um, I was flying private everywhere I went. I was flying out of uh, Fort Lauderdale Executive Airport. I was flying private. Uh, you know, every other weekend in Vegas, uh, you know, name your cliche, you know, the prostitutes, the, the strippers, the cocaine, the, you know what I mean? Just the whole lifestyle. Um, I did it. You know, I had a thousand, I had a hundred, I had a hundred Cadillacs. You know what I mean? I had one for every day of the week. I had, you know, Rolexes and, you know, I did where, wherever I wanted to go, I went, whatever I wanted to buy, I bought. And I look back at that time in my life, like, it just seems like it's just a bad dream. You know what I mean? Almost like it's just like, I look at it now as if, when I look back at those memories, as if it was somebody else living that life and not me. And I know that's weird, and I know that's probably just some mental, some mental shit. But yeah, it was, it was pretty, it was pretty amazing. Definitely was pretty amazing. You know, and to come from, I you know, I used to eat out of trash cans. You know what I mean? Like I used to have to wait for Seven Eleven to throw away their sandwiches. I had it time, but I knew what days they threw away their fucking sandwiches, so I could climb in the dumpster and eat, and eat fucking, eat, eat that day. You know what I mean? So going from extreme, you know, levels of poverty to, you know, that that extreme. Um, lifestyle I was living was that whole journey was just completely insane. You know, it was it was completely insane. So I found your story because of Matt Cox, and I recently spoke with him, and I asked him a question, and he gave me a very surprising answer. So I want to ask it to you as well. I asked him that if he has a rough month financially, or he has a, a tough period during a global pandemic, I said, Matt. Do you ever, after everything you've been through, have thoughts of going back to that trap? And he told me almost every single night. So I would ask you, when you're going through it, whether it's financially or stressful, you're reminiscing on those lifestyle days of private jets, does that start creeping in saying, hey, that's always an option? Yeah, the best way I can describe it is somebody who is like a former alcoholic or a drug user. And that is always going to be in the back of my brain. You know what I mean? That it's, it's always right there, just on the edge of my periphery. Like, I know that if my life turns shit and I have to, and, and it's, it's, I have to go back to living on the street, guess what? I'm probably going to have to gear up for another fucking run and take my chances. Because I'm, I'm never going to go back to, to eating out of trash cans. Fuck that. That will never happen again. You know what I mean? And if I have to, and if I have to go back to prison, it's either going to be one of the two. It's either going to be eating out of trash cans or going back to prison because I'm not, you know what I mean? There's no middle ground. Yeah. So yeah, like, I like Matt said, every day, every single day I think about it. To celebrate the new podcast, I'm giving away a PlayStation 5 to one of my viewers. All you have to do is like and subscribe. That's it. Full details in the comments. Good luck.